10 Bizarre Unsolved Shopping Mall Mysteries During the mid-1970s, two of the most infamous missing persons cases in U.S. history took place within a three-month period. On December 23, 1974, 17-year-old Mary Rachel Jolica, 14-year-old Lisa Renee Wilson, and 9-year-old Julianne Mosley, aka the Fort Worth Three, all vanished without explanation during a shopping trip to a mall in Fort Worth, Texas. Only three months later, 12-year-old Sheila Lyon and her 10-year-old sister, Catherine, both went missing during a trip to a shopping mall in Wheaton, Maryland. These cases were particularly shocking because it seemed impossible that multiple girls could simultaneously disappear from a crowded shopping mall without anybody seeing anything. Sadly, even though malls are busy public places, unexplained disappearances and unsolved murders do occur there without anybody getting caught. 1. The murder of Lester Garnier in early 2002, San Francisco Police Inspector Michael Gaynor traveled back to FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., to analyze a fingerprint that had tantalized local authorities for 14 years. His mission was a gamble. He had only a partial print lifted in July 1988, from the window of a car in which an off-duty SFPD vice officer, Lester Garnier, was found shot to death. Garnier's killing in the parking lot of a Walnut Creek shopping center had never been solved, and investigators had long considered the print to be of no value. Gaynor's gamble paid off, but not in a way anyone expected. For years, rumors had swirled around the death of the 30-year-old vice cop, that he had been killed because of something he knew, some investigation he had gotten too close to, or maybe because he had angered someone in the underworld of vice. But the match Gaynor found was to someone unknown to anyone involved in the Garnier case, the ex-wife of a Navy petty officer, a Scottish citizen who had a history of drug abuse and prostitution arrests. Catherine Kuntz's fingerprint had been in the FBI files since three years after Garnier was killed, when she was arrested in Virginia and accused of soliciting the murder of her husband. In the six years since Gaynor's find, Investigators have gone from the Bay Area to Virginia to North Dakota to Florida, trying to build a case against Kunz. Last week, having failed three times to persuade Contra Costa County prosecutors to bring charges, police conceded they didn't have enough at this time to press a case against their prime suspect. The portrait investigators have drawn of Kunz, 44, is that of a longtime cocaine addict who held down jobs at restaurants and convenience stores to get by. She has been the target of a major prosecution only once, in the Virginia case, and that time she managed to escape a felony conviction, thanks in part to the devotion of her then-husband, who had survived an attempt on his life but remained loyal to her. Catherine Scotty Overend was born May 24, 1964, in Dunoon, on the coast of Scotland one of four children in a railway worker's family. At 21, while working as a barmaid, she met a U.S. Navy officer stationed in Scotland named Gregory Kunz. When he was shipped back stateside to the Concord Naval Weapons Station, she came with him, and in 1985, the couple married. The honeymoon proved to be short. Navy duty resulted in Greg Kunz being sent to far-flung places while his bride was left behind in their Martinez apartment. Catherine Kunz began disappearing as well, authorities say, into the world of prostitution and drugs. Her husband would often be gone for extended periods of time, out on ships, said Police Sergeant Jay Hill, who is heading the Walnut Creek investigation into Garnier's killing, and he would sometimes come home and find her not around. Although Walnut Creek police said they had no record of her ever being arrested in the Bay Area for prostitution. Deputy District Attorney Harold Jewett of Contra Costa County said Kuntz was turning tricks and becoming addicted to crack cocaine. In recent interviews with investigators, she admitted to engaging in acts of prostitution during the time she was here, Jewett said. By 1988, the Kuntzes had moved to a modest apartment at the corner of Monument Boulevard and Cary Drive in Concord, a few blocks from Interstate 680. Concord was also where Garnier was living in a house he had bought for his parents. Garnier joined the San Francisco Police Department in 1980 and four years later earned a spot in the vice unit. Although many acquaintances described him as a compassionate, honest and able officer, San Francisco police investigators knew he had frequented at least one massage parlor during his off-duty hours. It was never clear if he had seen prostitutes in San Francisco. Garnier's body was found slumped over the wheel of his Corvette early July 11, 1988 in a parking lot at 1295 South Main Street in Walnut Creek. Police believe he was shot late the previous night, 
but beyond that the circumstances of the shooting have always been a mystery. One witness reported seeing a woman get out of the Corvette around the time the shots were fired. Garnier was struck by two slugs from a .380 semi-automatic pistol, possibly his own weapon but the gun was never found. The police also noted the fingerprint on Garnier's passenger side window, but didn't consider it usable. Jewett said the fingerprint that turned out to be Kuntz's was found on the top of the Corvette's window, as if she had used her hand to grab the glass while the window was partially down. There's evidence she was with Officer Garnier that night, Jewett said, declining to be more specific. He noted, a fingerprint does not establish what role she played in the actual homicide, if any. Catherine Kuntz held a series of fast food jobs during those years as she and her Navy officer husband moved around from Martinez to Concord to Alameda, but the couple's pay didn't keep up with the bills. The Kuntzes filed for bankruptcy protection in 1989, listing $870 in assets and $22,601 in liabilities. The Navy reassigned Greg Kuntz to Norfolk, VA, in 1990, and the couple went across the country to make a fresh start. Catherine Kuntz found work at a local market, but something apparently went badly wrong. On February 20, 1991, 17-year-old Malene de Cooper, a runaway who had befriended Catherine Kuntz and another employee at the convenience store, shot Greg Kuntz at his apartment, police said. He survived. Cooper was quickly arrested as were Catherine Kuntz and the co-worker, John Murchison. After denying to police that she had anything to do with the shooting, Cooper told investigators that Catherine Kuntz had asked her to kill her husband in exchange for $15,000, in life insurance money. Murchison admitted he had helped recruit Cooper. When Kuntz went on trial for attempted murder, Cooper testified that Kuntz had wanted to divorce her husband but worried she would lose her green card status if she did. Joe Lindsay, Cooper's lawyer at the time, said the portrait his client painted of Kuntz was frightening. This lady is so sinister, so maniacal to pull this young girl in, Lindsay said. Kuntz told Cooper, they were friends, gave this tale of woe about being a victim of abuse. This was something to help her get out the life she was experiencing. There were promises that they would live together and she would take care of her. But Kuntz found an unexpected ally. Her husband, Greg Kuntz took the stand and said that he loved and trusted his wife and that she would never have solicited his murder. He not only testified for her, they got back together, said Catherine Kuntz's trial attorney, Carol France McKenzie. He believed, he forgave her, he loved her. The defense attorney was more than a little surprised. Had I been the husband, I probably would not have had the same feelings he did. McKenzie said, I just remember being stunned at the husband's position. I encouraged it doesn't mean I wasn't surprised. Cooper was convicted of attempted murder and Murchison was convicted of soliciting to commit murder. Each served several of years in prison. Greg Kuntz's testimony helped his wife secure an acquittal on an attempted murder charge. She proceeded to plead guilty to a misdemeanor, walked out of jail and returned to her husband. A new start the couple moved to Florida in December 1991, but their marriage soon collapsed and they were divorced in August 1992. Greg Kuntz moved to North Dakota where other members of his family lived, got a job at a state prison and remarried. He has cooperated with Bay Area authorities on the Garnier case, investigators said. He did not return calls seeking comment for this story. Three months after the divorce, Catherine Kuntz married again, to a man six years her junior named Timothy Wise. Police say that during their short marriage, Kuntz was arrested twice on prostitution charges in Florida but was never convicted. She filed for divorce in 1995, after lodging domestic violence charges of which Wise was convicted. Kuntz is still in Florida. In 2006, she was sentenced to probation for cocaine possession, and last year was sent to state prison after failing a drug test and failing to complete community service, said her attorney, Bill Ham. Her sentence of one year and a day is set to end June 19. Ham said last week that he was unaware of the Garnier investigation. Kuntz has not been available for an interview. Walnut Creek Police led the initial investigation into the Garnier killing and guarded information from San Francisco, apparently in part because of the theory that other San Francisco officers might have had something to do with his death. Police went so far as to test 10 San Francisco officers' guns, but results came back negative and no other evidence has emerged to point to Garnier's old colleagues. If there was a personal connection between Kuntz and Garnier, police aren't saying what it is. We can't share exactly what our theories are, and we can't be specific about what we think may be their reasoning for being together, said Hill, 
the sergeant leading Walnut Creek's investigation, but he added, there's no connection between her and San Francisco. She's never been arrested by San Francisco police, and, Garnier, has never arrested her. Walnut Creek investigators decided in 2001 that the fingerprint from the car window, long thought to be unusable, in fact had some promising detail. Jewett said that led to Gaynor's trip to the FBI and then to an investigation that has brought investigators to the doors of Greg Kunz, to other Navy personnel stationed in the Bay Area in the 1980s, to Catherine Kunz's ex-husband wise in Florida and to everyone she has ever said hello to, Hill said. They have also spoken many times to Catherine Kunz, said Walnut Creek Police Lieutenant Tim Schultz, who declined to repeat what she said. Last week, Police offered a $250,000 reward for information that leads to a conviction in the killing. Former San Francisco Deputy Chief John Willett, who launched one of the SFPD's efforts to re-examine the case over the years, hopes the money will prompt someone to come forward with information to keep the case from hitting a dead end. If that happens, he said, I think there will be mixed feelings. The feelings of officers who felt Lester was a straight cop doing his job and then the feelings of the other people who will think he was involved with these prostitutes and his killing had nothing to do with his job. 2. The Murders of Nancy and Joey Bocchicchio On December 12, 2007, 47-year-old Nancy Bocchicchio and her 7-year-old daughter, Joey, went to the town center mall in Boca Raton, Florida. They were last seen exiting the mall together at approximately 3.10 p.m. Nearly nine hours later, Nancy's SUV was discovered by a security guard in the mall parking lot with its engine running. When the guard checked inside, he discovered the bodies of Nancy and Joey. They had both been bound with plastic ties and duct tape and forced to wear black towel swim goggles before they were shot to death. It was soon discovered that Nancy's ATM card had been used at a nearby bank to withdraw $500 leading investigators to believe that the mother and daughter had been carjacked and robbed before they were murdered. Nancy's cell phone had also been used to call 911, but it was immediately disconnected before anyone answered. Curiously, this was far from the only carjacking to take place at the Town Center Mall in 2007. On March 23, a woman named Randy Gorenberg was carjacked by an unknown individual in the parking lot. She was subsequently shot to death and dumped from her vehicle 8 kilometers five miles away. On August 7, a woman and her two-year-old son were carjacked by a man in the mall parking garage, who forced her to drive to a nearby ATM and withdraw $600. After binding the woman and her son and putting black towel goggles over her eyes, the man drove the victims back to the mall but left without harming them. It's possible that this was the same perpetrator who murdered Nancy and Joey Bocchicchio, but he has never been identified and all three of these crimes remain unsolved. A reward for information is being boosted to $400,000. In the 2007, slayings of a mother and her seven-year-old daughter outside an upscale South Florida mall as investigators appealed a new Tuesday for the public's help in solving the case. No one has been arrested in the killings of Nancy Bocchicchio, 47, and seven-year-old Joey Bocchicchio Hauser. Their bodies were found December 12, 2007, inside their still-running vehicle in the parking lot of Boca Raton's town center mall. Both had been wearing black towel goggles and bound with duct tape, plastic ties and handcuffs and were fatally shot, investigators said. The FBI and Boca Raton police said they have strong indications the killer has links to the Miami area. Soon after the slayings, Nancy Bocchicchio's credit card and cell phone were found in Miami and subsequent investigation has revealed that the duct tape and plastic ties were purchased at a Miami area home improvement store, Boca Raton Police Chief Daniel Alexander said. Maybe someone saw something. Maybe someone heard something, Alexander told reporters at the FBI's South Florida field office. Let's be candid. This is personal. We care about Nancy and Joey. Authorities believe the killings are connected to an August 2007 carjacking in which the victim survived, but was bound in a similar fashion and forced to withdraw cash from an ATM. That person provided information that led to a sketch of a potential suspect, described as a white man between 5 foot 10 and 6 foot 2 and in his 20s when the crimes were committed. In the Bokikio case, Investigators said they were abducted and driven to a nearby ATM and forced to withdraw $500, then returned to the mall parking lot. A 911 call was received from Nancy Bocchicchio's cell phone by the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, but it was disconnected before dispatchers could answer and a return call to her cell phone was not picked up. 
Investigators said they have pursued hundreds of leads but hope a new wave of publicity about the slayings might provide something new to go on. The reward is for information that leads to an arrest and conviction. It's getting a new set of eyes on an old case, said Michael Delonzo. FBI assistant special agent in charge of the Miami office. They are leaving no stone unturned. 3. The disappearance of Ann Gottlieb. Ann was last seen in her hometown of Louisville, Kentucky on June 1, 1983. She was riding her red and white bicycle from the Bashford Manor Mall back to her family's residence between 5.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. Her bicycle was later found propped up against a brick pillar outside of Bacon's department store in the mall. A photo of the bicycle is posted below this case summary. Ann never arrived home and has not been heard from again. The mall was across the street from her Gerald Court home. Three days after Ann's disappearance, a police bloodhound picked up her scent around a ditch near the mall and twice led investigators to the window of an apartment across the street. It was the residence of Esther Okmiansky, the grandmother of Ann's best friend. Tanya Okmiansky. Tanya was the last person to see Anne before she vanished. Esther said Anne had never visited her apartment. Officials eventually concluded that the dog had been distracted by the smell of cooking food. The entire family was checked and all were cleared of involvement. There was speculation that Anne ran because she was having trouble adjusting to life in America. Her loved ones say she was not unusually anxious and, if she had decided to run away, she would probably have contacted them eventually or taken money and her favorite possessions. There were several reported sightings of her, particularly in the Brighton Beach neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York, which has a high concentration of Russian immigrants. None of the sightings were ever substantiated, however. A theory that Anne was kidnapped by agents of the Soviet government in an attempt to force her family to return to that country has been discarded. In December 2008, Authorities announced they believed Gregory Lewis Oakley Jr. was responsible for Anne's abduction and murder. A photograph of Oakley is posted below this case summary. He had once abducted his stepdaughter and injected her with a painkiller drug to sedate her. He was charged with attempted murder in that case, but eventually pleaded guilty to assault. In September 1983, Oakley attacked a police officer's 13-year-old daughter in her home stabbed her and attempted to rape her. She survived. Oakley was arrested for the crime in January 1984, and was then questioned about Ann's case. He denied involvement, but he failed a polygraph test and bank records proved he made an ATM transaction at the Bashford Manor Mall just 100 minutes before Ann disappeared. Oakley stated he left Louisville on a business trip immediately after he finished at the bank. In June 1984, Oakley was convicted of burglary and attempted rape and sentenced to 30 years in prison. He was paroled on medical grounds in 2002, returned to his native Alabama and died of lung cancer months later. In September 2008, an inmate who had served time in prison with Oakley told authorities Oakley had killed Anne with an injection of the painkiller Talwin. He was a veterinarian and would have had easy access to the drug. The informant passed a polygraph about his information and Oakley's former girlfriend corroborated the story. She stated that at 11 p.m. on the night Anne disappeared, Oakley came to her Louisville home and asked her to wash some clothes for him. This contradicts his story that he left Louisville that afternoon, before Anne disappeared. Investigators stated if Oakley was alive today, based on the evidence now available, he would be charged with Anne's murder. The investigation into Anne's case remains active and authorities hope they can find her body. Her parents still live in the Louisville area and are hopeful that the case will someday be resolved. 4. The Disappearance of Guy Andre Kiefer Before vanishing from the parking lot of an Abidjan supermarket on April 16, 2004, Guy Andre Kiefer wrote about the volatile mix of cocoa profits, guns, and politics in Ivory Coast. A freelance journalist of French and Canadian descent and one of the few foreign reporters left in the conflict-written West African nation Kiefer had a hand in business himself as a consultant and advisor. Just two years into his stay in the former French colony, he had collected a wide network of political and business connections. And, by his own account, Kiefer had gathered some enemies. In the days before he disappeared and his normally busy cell phone suddenly went dead, the 54-year-old Kiefer told friends and family he had been getting threats and was concerned about his safety. The only named suspect in his disappearance is an Ivoirian businessman related by marriage to the country's first family. Michelle Leger, in custody since May 2004, claimed in questioning before a French judge that a number of people close to President Laurent Gbagbo were involved, 
several news organizations reported and an Ivoirian official confirmed for CBJ, yet no other suspects have been arrested and some witnesses have been hard to find. Leggers reported testimony has ignited speculation that Kiefer's disappearance was a state-sponsored crime, although investigators are also said to be considering a personal money matter or grudge as a possible motive. With its many unanswered questions, the case has stirred political intrigue and charges of government obstruction on two continents. The investigation has appeared to sputter at times as relations worsened between France and its former colony leaving Kiefer's family and friends to fight for the truth. This case has always been politicized. The fate of Guy André Kiefer is a nuisance to Franco-Ivoirian relations. His wife, Osange, said from Paris where she lives with the couple's 18-year-old daughter. Although most people believe he is dead, she has not abandoned hope. As long as they have not produced his body, I will not say that my husband is dead. Osange Kiefer said, he is one of 20 journalists whose disappearances over more than two decades may have been linked to their work. CPJ research shows, cooperation between France and Ivory Coast on the Kiefer case has been complicated by the two countries' long history, as well as their recently strained relations. Ivory Coast was a French colony for more than 60 years, and ties between it and France remained strong even after its independence in 1960. But tensions have risen since the Ivoirian Civil War began in 2002. Ivoirian government supporters have accused France of supporting the rebels, and the two countries briefly engaged in hostile actions last year. Nevertheless, the nations are still bound by a number of agreements including one that pledges them to cooperate on certain judicial investigations such as the Kiefer case. In interviews with CPJ, Kiefer's family and friends expressed confidence in the efforts of the French investigating judge, Patrick Ramiel, but accused both the Ivoirian and French governments of obstructing the investigations for political reasons. French Foreign Ministry spokesman Jean-Baptiste Matai denied such allegations. There is absolutely no desire to hamper Ramiel's movements in any way, he told CPJ. Elio, chief of staff for the Ivoirian Justice Minister, said the two countries were cooperating well on the judicial inquiry. Each time that Judge Ramiel asked for authorization to come to Abidjan it was granted, and he has been able to carry out investigations without any problems from the Justice Ministry, Yo said. But some of the people he wanted to question refused to answer the summons, and some have disappeared. Aileen Richard, Kiefer's friend and colleague for 15 years at the French business newspaper La Tribune, said she believes he was targeted for his investigations into sensitive business issues. Kiefer was considered a specialist in the profitable cocoa and coffee sectors, and worked briefly as a consultant for a company that advised the Ivoirian government on reforming the cocoa trade. Kiefer had undertaken several investigative stories, notably one that explored the alleged use of cocoa profits for arms purchases, according to the Paris-based business newsletter La Lettre du Continent to which Kiefer was freelance contributor. His last story concerned a payment to Guinea-Bissau from a frozen bank account belonging to that country's late former dictator and Soumain Maine. Kiefer's story charged that some Ivoirian officials took commissions from the account, according to La Lettre du Continent. While not ruling out the possibility that such stories led to Kiefer's disappearance, Stephen Smith, Africa editor of the French Daily Le Monde, is more circumspect. Smith told CPJ that Kiefer was walking a borderline between journalism and business, and that he sometimes used his reporting to influence business deals. In a May 5, 2004 article, Le Monde said that Kiefer informed some people, advised others and, under transparent pseudonyms, went hammer and tongs for senior personalities without worrying unduly about the possible dangers. France opened a judicial inquiry into Kiefer's disappearance in May 2004, after his wife filed a complaint in a Paris court. Ramiel went to Abidjan that month to begin his probe and question Leger, the brother-in-law of Ivory Coast's first lady, Simone Bagbo, and a regular source for Kiefer. Leger was due to meet Kiefer for lunch the day he disappeared and is the last person known to have seen him. Leger told Le Monde in May 2004, that Kiefer did not turn up for their lunch appointment but had called to say that he was at the nearby Prima supermarket, where Leger met him in the parking lot. He was nervous, tense, Leger told Le Monde. He told me only that he was due to meet a white guy who had owed him money for a long time, and that he planned to go to Ghana for the weekend. Leger told Le Monde that he left without asking further questions. During 10 hours of questioning before the French judge, Leger identified a number of senior defense, security, and finance officials as being involved in the disappearance, 
Yo said, of those named, each has publicly denied involvement, and none has officially been declared a suspect. Investigators have questioned most of the officials, Yo said, although they have been unable to find two soldiers named by Leger. Ramiel declined comment when contacted by CPJ citing judicial confidentiality rules. Shortly after the French investigation started, Ivoirian authorities launched their own inquiry. They arrested Lager and charged him as an accessory in the kidnapping, confinement, and though no body has been produced murder of Kiefer. The French judge has also charged Lager with complicity in Kiefer's kidnap and confinement. One of Lager's lawyers, Alana Samoy, told CPJ that Ramiel had pressured his client into linking government officials to the disappearance and that Leger had later retracted the assertions. He said his client had pleaded not guilty to all charges. Vietian, a presidential advisor, said allegations linking senior officials to Kiefer's disappearance were part of propaganda campaigns seeking to soil the image of the president and were promoted by media close to the opposition and to the armed rebellion. He added, there are several possible trails outside of the investigation pursued by the French judge, including ones implicating foreign citizens who have nothing to do with the president. Citing the two countries' judicial cooperation agreement, Ramiel has requested that Lego be transferred to France for two months of questioning. But at the end of February, Ramiel returned from a fourth visit to Abidjan without the suspect. Lego remained in prison in Abidjan when dangerous assignments went to press. Richard said she believes France is unwilling to pressure the Ivoirian authorities for fear of further damaging relations with President Gbagbo whom it sees as a necessary partner in the fragile peace process. Such concerns prompted Richard to set up the Truth for Guy Andre Kiefer Association. Composed mainly of journalists, the group has launched a petition on its website calling on the French and Ivoirian governments to employ every possible effort to find the truth. The association collects information about the case, lobbies the governments, and encourages media coverage. Osange Kiefer, who has met with Ramael, accused the French authorities of trying to stall the judge's investigation and block Leger's transfer. An official from the French Foreign Ministry said that any delays were due to normal procedures and that the transfer request was being processed. I know the judges and I believe they are interested in finding the truth, Le Monde editor Smith said. But I think it embarrasses the two governments, and there is extreme tension between the two governments. The strain was at its worst last November when Ivoirian government air attacks on rebel positions killed nine French peacekeepers. The French retaliated by destroying most of the small Ivoirian air force. This action led to violent anti-French demonstrations in Abidjan that were fueled by state-owned media. Thousands of expatriates fled the country. Despite a peace agreement brokered by France in early 2003, Ivory Coast remains divided between a rebel-held north and a government-controlled south. Most foreign reporters have left the country for security reasons, especially after the October 2003 murder of Radio France International correspondent Jean Helene by an Ivoirian police officer. Helene's murder was widely blamed on anti-French sentiments that were whipped up by local media and pro-government forces. Richard complains that Kiefer's case has received less attention from the French government and media than those of journalists Florence Aubinas, Christian Chestnut, and Georges Malbrianot who were abducted in Iraq. Abinas, who works for the independent Daily Liberation, was taken in Baghdad with her Iraqi translator on January 5. Chestnut of Radio France International RFI, and Malbrianot of independent Daily Le Figaro were released in December after being held captive for four months by an Iraqi insurgent group. I think it's absolutely normal that people mobilize for Abinas, Chestnut and Malbrianot. Richard told CPJ, what is not normal is that they don't do the same for Kiefer. If you are a freelance and you go missing, it's more difficult. The vast majority of the 20 journalists on CPJ's missing list disappeared in conflict zones such as Chechnya, Kosovo, and Iraq. Others vanished in remote areas where there is little media attention. Nearly all went missing in places where the rule of law is weak, the judiciary ineffective, and the government indifferent to solving such cases. Left behind are the journalists' families who, in most cases, have few credible details to help them understand what may have happened. They have little to cling to but the fight itself the struggle to keep their cases on government agendas and in the headlines. It's very, very important, Osange Kiefer said because it means the cloak of silence cannot fall. 5. The Disappearance of Mary Frances Hunter Mary's husband, Derek Hunter, 
stated that he last saw her in the parking lot of Cascade Mall in Burlington, Washington on September 1, 1996. They were on a trip with Mary's dog to go target shooting in rural Skagit County when they stopped to shop at the mall in Burlington. A photograph of Derek is posted below this case summary. Mary had introduced Derek to an unidentified male while they were inside the shopping center earlier in the day. The man is described as about six feet tall and clean cut with an average or thin build. Mary said that the man was a former high school classmate. She introduced him as Tony or Todd. She and the man were standing by the Hunter family's vehicle in the mall's lot when Derek went to use the toilet. When he returned to the car a short time later, Mary had vanished. The man and Mary's dog were also missing. None of them have been seen again. Derek searched the mall for five hours before giving up and going home. The next day he went to the mall again to look for his wife and found her dog which was slightly scraped or scratched as if it had fallen out of a vehicle. He never saw Mary or the unidentified man again. She was last seen carrying an orange backpack which contained two Smith & Wesson guns, a .357 Magnum and a 9mm semi-automatic. Mary resided at the United States Naval Air Station Hidby Island in Oak Harbor, Washington in 1996. Derek was an officer in the Navy at the time of her disappearance. Mary left a significant amount of cash in her bank account. She and Derek have two children. They were living with their teenage son at the time Mary disappeared, but their 15-year-old daughter ran away from home in 1995. The daughter has since married and moved away from the area. Mary has never been heard from again. She took no credit cards, clothes, money, or her driver's license. Derek reported her as a missing person to authorities on September 3, 1996, two days after she was last seen. After her disappearance he claimed that Mary was withdrawing money from her bank account at automatic teller machines ATMs, but security cameras at the ATMs showed Derek withdrawing the funds using Mary's ATM card. He also took Mary's name off of his insurance policy and attempted to do the same with their jointly owned vehicles so he could sell them. Derek filed for divorce a year after Mary vanished, but withdrew the filing three months later. Derek retired from the Navy in 1998. Medical records indicate that he suffered progressive mental and physical deterioration after Mary vanished. He was treated for depression, alcoholism, and post-traumatic stress disorder in the years after his retirement and suffered from fainting spells and occasional episodes of amnesia. Derek shot himself to death in his parents' home in Florida in September 2003, seven years to the day after his wife's disappearance. He left several notes, including one which stated that Mary had committed suicide and at her request he would never reveal the location of her body. Investigators believe Derek, who was described as a possessive and controlling husband, may have murdered Mary. They contemplated charging him prior to his death but there was insufficient evidence to ensure a conviction. Mary is very fond of children and animals. She has been frequently employed as a babysitter. Her hobbies include hiking, target shooting and visiting libraries. She was born in Phoenix, Arizona and raised in Mount Vernon, Washington, near Puget Sound. Mary frequently visited the Seattle, Washington area prior to her disappearance. She has left her home before but never for very long. Authorities have received numerous tips as to where her remains might be, and have dug in several places in the Burlington area, but have not found anything connected to Mary's case. Her case remains unsolved. 6. The Disappearance of Lucy Meadows Lucy was reportedly last seen in the parking lot of the Rivergate Mall in Goodlettsville, Tennessee on July 25, 1996. Her mother, Young Meadows, told authorities that she let Lucy exit their vehicle's back seat on the driver's side. Young then walked to the passenger side of the car to retrieve packages. When she turned around, Lucy had disappeared. The mall's security team was alerted to Lucy's disappearance immediately and an extensive search of the parking lot and surrounding area was completed by law enforcement. No evidence related to her case was discovered although witnesses saw a brown or champagne-colored minivan in the parking lot which may be connected to her disappearance. It has never been identified. Lucy has never been heard from again. Lucy resided on a farm in Clarksville, Tennessee with her parents in 1996. Investigators searched the property, but there was no indication of her whereabouts. Her parents filed for divorce a month after her disappearance. The divorce was granted in 1997. Young was granted custody of both the couple's children. Lucy's father is actively involved in her case. In November 2004, 
a witness came forward and said he had seen Lucy at her parents' home on the night prior to her disappearance and the child looked as if she could have been dead. At least two adults were present, including Lucy's mother, and the witness stated the adults appeared to be panic-stricken, asked for a Bible and shouted Lucy's name repeatedly. The witness was only 12 years old at the time Lucy disappeared and says he didn't come forward sooner because he initially didn't realize the significance of what he saw. He has passed a polygraph test and investigators believe his story. The witness has not been identified, but investigators stated he is a family member. Young has reportedly been uncooperative in the investigation and has given inconsistent statements. She initially said Lucy was out of her sight for only a few seconds, then changed the time to 10 to 15 minutes. In addition, a witness reported that Young said Lucy disappeared from a mall in Clarksville, Tennessee, before saying she disappeared from the Rivergate Mall. Investigators have stated they do not believe Lucy was at either mall on the day she was supposedly abducted. Young has failed two polygraph tests about her daughter's disappearance, and when she was last interviewed, she refused to make a statement at all. Authorities are attempting to start a grand jury investigation about Lucy's disappearance in Montgomery County, the county where she lived, rather than Davidson County, where the Rivergate Mall is. No suspects have been named in Lucy's disappearance and it remains classified as a non-family abduction. 7. The Murder of Christy Mullins Christy Mullins, a 14-year-old sophomore to be at Wedgetone High School, wasn't supposed to be at Graceland Shopping Center when she met her death August 23, 1975. A murder trial worthy of Barry Mason more than two years later led to the acquittal of the only person ever charged in connection with the case. To this day, her bludgeoning death remains unsolved. John Aller would love to change that, and he's hoping some contemporaries of Christy can help. An attorney who stepped down from active practice in 2011, the Manhattan resident has turned his hand to writing nonfiction and a book about the Christy Mullins murder is his next project. Aller, brother of Columbus Dispatch Sports reporter Rob Aller, was a journalism student at Ohio State University at the time of the crime, which he believes ranks as the second most sensational unsolved murder in the state, behind only the Sam Shepard case. It was a huge thing, John Aller said in an interview last week. Certainly, anyone who was a teenager or older in central ohio or columbus at the time will remember it there's never been a book written about it but it deserves one he wrote in an email covering his reasons for taking up the challenge mullins whose family lived on rosslyn avenue had been swimming with another 14 year old carol reeves in a pool at the broad meadows apartments the day of her death when christy reeves carol's 10 year old sister stopped by to say someone had called the Reeves home several times wanting to speak with Carol. According to later testimony, the caller said he was a disc jockey and that there was to be a cheerleading contest behind the Wolco department store at Graceland Shopping Center. Tickets to the Ohio State Fair would be awarded the winner. Carol Reeves met Mullins on the way to Graceland, but when no contest appeared to be taking place, Reeves went into the store to check on the time. Mullins was gone when she got back. In spite of two alleged eyewitnesses and a confession, the only man to be charged with using a length of board to fracture the girl's skull, Jack Carmen, had his guilty plea withdrawn, due to a new defense team, doubts cast on his guilt by many, including the parents of the murdered girl, and a major investigative piece written by Jim Yavorsik and Rick Kelly, colleagues of ours at The Lantern. Ohio State's student newspaper. I was working on the Lantern at the time the story broke, and the story was largely broken by a couple of Lantern reporters, Aller said. They were kind of a Woodward and Bernstein investigative team, coming on the heels of Watergate. It made a huge splash on campus, even though the story itself really had very little to do with Ohio State, as such. I didn't personally work on the story. But those two guys became almost celebrities overnight. During a trial that began 28 months after Carmen was taken into custody, his lawyers sought to prove that the man with a development disability had an alibi, in that he was at the Volunteers of America facility on West Broad Street where he lived at the time of the murder. They also argued he simply wasn't intelligent enough to have committed the crime and that one of the two alleged eyewitnesses who said they saw him striking the girl with the board was actually the guilty party. In an email, Aller wrote he is not necessarily hoping to solve the case. The story is powerful enough that it will make a good read, regardless of whether the case is cracked after all these years, he wrote. That said, it would be great if the book were to lead to a new focus on the case by law enforcement authorities, 
such as Columbus Police Cold Case Unit, and greater yet if somehow it could be solved. There are new technologies, such as DNA testing, that weren't around in the late 1970s, and with changes in relationships between some of the key witnesses, and the deaths of others who can no longer instill fear into those who talk, who knows what might result from publication of a book on the subject. My guess is, as in any community, the teenagers know the real deal that's going on a lot better than the adults and their parents, Aller said in an interview. I suspect that a lot of these people were never interviewed by the police back then, because the police quickly concluded that Carmen was the murderer. Aller has been in touch with some adults who were students with Mullins at what was then Dominion Junior High School and Whetstone High School, but he said he wants to speak with more. 8. The Edison Mall Disappearances Mary was last seen leaving the Edison Mall and heading towards the parking lot in Fort Myers, Florida on the evening January 16, 1981. She and her brother and mother had gone to the mall together at 6.30 p.m. Mary bought a package of pretzels and said she was tired and going back to their car, a Burgundy 1979. Chevrolet Camaro. She left carrying the pretzels and some packages. An hour later, Mary's mother went out to the parking lot and discovered her daughter was wrong. The pretzels and packages were on top of the Camaro's trunk. She was initially believed to be a runaway, as there was no evidence of a crime in her case. However, Mary's family never believed she ran away. She had been saving up money to buy a vehicle. She was in the middle of redecorating her room, she didn't take her purse with her, and she was looking forward to getting her orthodontic braces taken off in a few weeks. Mary Elizabeth Hare, an 18-year-old who physically resembled Mary Oppitz, disappeared from the same parking lot on February 11, almost a month after Mary. As in Mary Oppitz's case, her car was found abandoned in the parking lot and no clues were left behind. Authorities at the time were uncertain as to whether the cases were related. A photo of Hare is posted below this case summary. She physically resembled Mary Oppitz. They had other things in common as well. Both of them grew up in New York and spoke with a slight regional New York accent. Both disappeared while on routine errands, and both were considered well-behaved teenagers with no significant problems in their lives. Mary Oppitz worked at Mariner's Inn, where Hare and her friends sometimes went, but there's no evidence that the two females knew each other. In June 1981, Hare's fully clothed and badly decomposed body was found in Lehigh Acres, Florida. She was the victim of a homicide, she had been stabbed in the back. There has been no trace of Mary Oppitz, however, and she has never been heard from again. Authorities began to suspect foul play was involved in Mary's case after Hare's body was discovered. Authorities theorized that Christopher Wilder, a man linked to at least a dozen disappearances, rapes, murders and or attacks of numerous women in the early to mid-1980, is a suspect in Mary's disappearance and Hare's homicide. A photo of Wilder is posted below this case summary. He was known to frequent the Florida region during this time. He sometimes attempted to lure young female victims by offering non-existent modeling sessions or other tactics. Wilder was put on probation in 1980 after pleading guilty to attempted sexual battery towards a teenage girl. While on a visit home to Australia that same year, he was charged with kidnapping and sexually assaulting two teenaged girls. His parents bailed him out of jail and he flew back to the United States, promising to return for his trial which was set for April 1984. He is also a suspect in the Florida disappearances of Rosario Gonzalez, Elizabeth Kenyon, and in Tammy Leppert. He was killed during a shootout with authorities in 1984. Mary's case remains unsolved. 9. The Disappearance of Kristen Modafferi Nearly two years after Kristen Modafferi vanished from her San Francisco job, police have identified a man they want to question in her disappearance, after three other women said they were held against their will and allegedly tortured by the man. A segment on her disappearance aired Saturday on Fox Television's America's Most Wanted. A spokesman for the show said Sunday that the tip line logged more than 70 callers with possible information about a man police believe is crucial to solving the Modafferi case. That is definitely a significant number of tips for us for one night, said show publicist Avery Mann. The three women, who have told their stories to police, said John Onuma. 37, was the man who allegedly tortured them, 
deprived them of sleep, burned them or held them against their will. Police said they have been trying for months to track him down. Onum lived in San Francisco and Oakland for several of years in the mid-1990s and also has lived on the Big Island of Hawaii. Oakland police said on the show that they have been trying for months to track down Onuma because they believe he may know what happened to Mo Deferi. One woman in the show quoted Onuma as saying, You know I'm going to have to kill you. I can't let you go. Now you know what happened to Kristen Mo Deferi. In Bay Area for 22 days, Mo Deferi, who had arrived in the Bay Area only 22 days earlier, disappeared on June 23, 1997. She was last seen at a Geary Street bus stop after leaving her job at a coffee bar in Crocker Galleria. She was headed for Land's End. She had told fellow workers, to attend a summer solstice party at Ocean Beach. Although bloodhounds picked up her scent on a trail near the ocean, she has not been seen since. One of the women on the TV show called Onuma a human vampire, another said she was his sex slave and the third says he beat her when she tried to escape. The Charlotte Observer newspaper quoted Mann on Thursday as saying, the police are saying they believe this man is connected to her disappearance. They're trying to figure out what the connection is. But they can't figure that out until they talk to him, and he's disappeared. Oakland police officer Patrick Mahoney, who's heading the investigation, was not available for comment. Onuma, who police say has a minor criminal record, has long been considered a possible suspect by police. Police first learned of him, according to the TV show, when he telephoned police to say two women had killed Mo Deferi and dumped her body in Marin County. After first denying he was the tipster, Onuma admitted his calls and, police said on the show, told them he could help them solve the mystery behind Mo Deferi's disappearance. Then he vanished. He was last spotted in Hawaii several months ago. Mo Deferi had come to the Bay Area on her 18th birthday to take photography courses at Ike Barkley before returning to her sophomore year at North Carolina State University. She was studying design at NC State. During initial stages of the investigation, police found a copy of the Bay Guardian in her Oakland apartment leading them to speculate that she may have placed or answered a personal ad. An ad in the paper police believed she placed treat, friends, female seeking friends to share activities, who enjoy music, photography, working out, walks, coffee or simply exploring the Bay Area. Interested? Call me. Police believe Onuma used personal ads to find women he could victimize, according to the television show. One of the women interviewed on the show said she met Onuma through a telephone service. Mo Deferi's parents have maintained an intense public search for their daughter, making frequent trips to the Bay Area, appearing on television talk shows, talking to newspapers, putting up billboards and otherwise trying to keep her disappearance in the public eye. Mo Deferi's 20th birthday is June 1st exactly two years after her parents last saw her. We've heard that there may be some good leads this time, said her mother, Debbie Mo Deferi. This time, then. The disappearance of Kitris Lee. Every parent knows the feeling. The moment when you turn to look for your child and they are not there. The fear and panic, followed by an intense wave of relief when you find them again. But for one mother, Sharon Lee, that feeling of relief has never come. It is now more than 30 years since her two-year-old daughter Kitris vanished without trace during a shopping trip on a military base in Germany. All Sharon has left today are a few yellowing photographs of a happy little girl playing on a swing and smiling alongside her older sister. As well as dealing with the guilt and heartbreak over the loss of her child, Mrs. Lee has also faced a battle with the British Army which, she believes, was intent on blaming her for the little girl's disappearance while denying that they could have done more to find her. The Ministry of Defense has now reopened the case, finally acknowledging that its original investigation was flawed. It has also apologized for its appalling treatment of Mrs. Lee and her family, and promised an independent review by a civilian police force. Gedris disappeared from a military shopping center in Potterborn, Germany, on November 28, 1981. Her second birthday, mother and daughter had gone to the Nafi store to buy items for a party while her father, Richard Lee, a sergeant in the King's Royal Hussars, waited in the car outside. I remember that morning. It was the last time I ever held my daughter, says Mrs. Lee. Beatrice was excited. It was her second birthday. She didn't really quite understand what that meant, but she'd had her presence and she knew something special was going on. My husband drove us. We couldn't find a parking space. So he waited in the car while my sister Wendy, Gitris and I went inside. It was packed with people as it was the last army paid day before Christmas. Gitris didn't want to sit in the trolley, she demanded to be carried, 
and I held her while we did the shopping. Then she disappeared. We had reached the checkout, recalls Mrs. Lee. We had started putting our shopping onto the conveyor belt. As I was getting the items out I realized I had forgotten to get crisps for the party. I put Catrice down and said to my sister, just watch her while I nip back and get them. The shop was jam-packed full. Wendy was putting stuff out on the conveyor belt. I didn't want to push back through the crowds carrying Catrice, so I just asked Wendy to watch her for two minutes. It was as simple as that. I don't blame Wendy, she adds. How could you blame her? Why would you think that your daughter was going to disappear that morning when you were just out on a family shop for her birthday? It should have been a joyous occasion. Wendy didn't deliberately let her run off. It is just one of those things that children do. Even when they are standing with their parents, children still run off to look at something. When I left Gitrus with Wendy she may have seen me run down the aisle and may have followed me. I don't know. Who knows what's in the mind of a two-year-old. Maybe she thought mommy was having a game with her and she followed me. I don't know. All I know is that after I put her down, I never saw her again. That was the last time I ever saw my daughter. When she came back, Gitrus wasn't there. The panel hit me. I ran around, calling her name. She was gone. Vanished. The rest of the day was a blur. A military policewoman was at one of the other checkouts and radioed for assistance. Soon a full-scale search was underway. I remember very little else about that day. My life was changed forever, it was the beginning of a waking nightmare. From the start, the military were convinced that Catrice had simply wandered off. They thought I hadn't kept a proper eye on her. I remember soon after she disappeared. The Royal Military Police came to our married quarters. They were friendly but I've come to wish I'd said nothing. They asked me whether Catrice liked ducks and I quite innocently said, Yes, of course, don't all children like ducks? Looking back, that seems to have sealed my daughter's fate. The Royal Military Police and the local German police decided that she had walked out of the shop and wandered to the nearby river and fallen in and drowned. Yet that explanation would have involved Catrice walking out of the shop on her own down a ramp, across a busy car park, through a hedge, and along the river. No one had seen her do this, says Sharon. But that is the only explanation they would allow. They searched the river, they couldn't find her, but days and days were lost. They would not acknowledge that there could be any other explanation. Nothing we said would shake them from their conviction that she was a lost child. It was six weeks until they interviewed the cashiers in the shop. One of the cashiers came forward 20 years later and said she had never even been spoken to. The original investigation never considered the possibility that Catrice might have been abducted. The Nafi was not inside a military compound, and there was no security surrounding it. It was on a civilian street. But the case has never been classified as a crime by the local German police. When the theory that Catrice had wandered off produced no leads, Mrs. Lee believes the military closed ranks to ensure that there was no suggestion that it failed to investigate the case thoroughly. We attempted to raise awareness of Catrice's disappearance, says Sharon. We tried to arrange a collection to put money up for a reward for information. We intended to launch the collection to coincide with a planned visit by Princess Margaret. But at the last minute, the royal visit was cancelled and all the men, who had intended to help us raise the money, were confined to barracks. She claims that she has also seen an internal military assessment of the family, written by an army psychologist, which dismisses Mrs. Lee as a woman of low intelligence. We were treated without empathy or humanity. It was like we were in irritation, interrupting the strict discipline of the military. We had lost our daughter but we were in the way. They thought we should move on. Forget it. Not ask too many questions. Sharon, 59, a former HR manager from Gosport, Hampshire, and retired Sergeant Major Richard Lee, 63, from Hartlepool, who has described his daughter's disappearance as an open wound, divorced 20 years ago but remain united in their fight for the truth about what happened to Catrice. They are also heavily involved in a support group for the families of other missing children, which includes Madeline McCann's parents Kate and Jerry. Last year they succeeded in getting the case reopened. The new investigation is, finally, focused on the theory that Catrice may have been abducted. Officers are interviewing witnesses ignored for three decades. They have produced an aged image of Catrice, who would now be 33, and have taken DNA samples from the family. They are also searching medical records. Catrice had a squint in one eye and would have required an operation. Officers are searching records for a child of the right age with the same eye condition. Last week, Defense Minister Mark Francois wrote to the family acknowledging the failings in the case. In a statement, Mr. Francois said, 
the Royal Military Police have now acknowledged that the previous investigations were flawed, and have sincerely apologized to Kittress's family for these failings. A letter to Ian Wright, her father's MP and a former children's minister, goes further. Mr. Francois wrote, as you know, I met with Mrs. Sharon Lee on 13 December. At that meeting, Brigadier Bill Warren, the Provost Marshal, Army, acknowledged that the previous investigations were flawed. He added, during the meeting, the Royal Military Police also discussed the current state of play on the work underway to better understand the actions taken by the police in 1981, and provided the family an opportunity to feed in their own thoughts and recollections from the spirit to the senior investigating officer. Mark Francois has been brilliant, says Mrs. Lee. He is coming at it as a family man rather than as someone from the Ministry of Defense. He seems to have great sympathy for us as a family and what we have been through. He is the first person from the MOD in 30 years who was prepared to sit and meet with us and listen to what we had to say. She adds, after so long, it is nice to finally hear that I am believed, that I am no longer being dismissed as a crazy woman who won't go away won't move on. We still have had no explanation as to why we were not taken seriously, and why the army tried to put the blame on us. We were dismissed as a family who failed to look after their daughter. From the beginning, there was a lack of humanity, a lack of care. One senior officer, just after Kitris disappeared, actually accused me of a lack of care of my daughter and said I had a terrible cross to bear. At our meeting with the minister, we learned that an investigator who came to our house the day Kitris disappeared to collect her pajamas to give her scent to the dogs, claimed that the only person in our quarters was our daughter Dasha. It was officially recorded that we had left our other daughter alone. But it was totally wrong. Our daughter was not alone. We wouldn't have let her out of our sight. I was there, her best friend was there, and other members of the family were there. But by recording this, it was as if someone was trying to emphasize the idea that we were negligent parents, that I was a bad mom, and the whole thing was my fault that we didn't care properly for our children. Natasha Lee, 38, was just seven when her sister disappeared. But I still have vivid memories of my sister. I remember she was bright and bubbly, cheeky. She used to follow me around. We shared a room most of the time. I was very proud of her. I was proud of being a big sister. Then she was gone. I remember my mother that day, after Kitris disappeared. I remember how she cried. The terrible sound she made. It haunts me. Natasha had stayed at home with her uncle that morning. Not being with them, there to look after her little sister, has left Natasha with an irrational feeling of guilt. I have terrible feelings about not going with them. No matter how much I tell myself it's not my fault, I still feel guilty. That day robbed me of a normal childhood and of my sister, and the chance to grow up with her. She was only just two. Her personality was just starting to come through. Her disappearance has left a hole in my life. I look in the mirror and wonder if she looks like me. If I look like her. Both Mrs. Lee and Natasha believe that Kitris was abducted. They live in hope that someday they will find out what happened. I believe she's alive somewhere and that one day we might find her, says Natasha. She might not want to know me. I'd be okay with that. I just want to know she's okay. I hope that she was taken by someone who couldn't have children, says Mrs. Lee. I hope that whoever took her loved her like I do, and brought her up and that she is happy somewhere. Last night, Ian Wright MP called on the Prime Minister to intervene in the case. He said, this is not a political question. The answers to what happened to Kittress are almost certainly in Germany. I want David Cameron to talk to the German government and to get their help. After 30 years, the family deserved to know what happened to their daughter.